Hi and welcome. We're so excited that you chose to join us today. And we hope that this message will inspire you to live the life that God designed you to live. For this message or others like it, you can go to our website or you can find us on our YouTube channel. Now sit back, relax, enjoy this message. Well, praise God forever. Amen. Come on, put your hands together for the Lord. Jesus is the Lord. And Jesus is here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus is Lord and Jesus is here. Amen. Well, I'm glad to be a part of what God is doing here at uh, Destiny Church. Amen. And I thank God for your pastors. They're great people and great leaders because they develop leaders. They believe in the future. Amen. And we train people and equip people not just for the present, but to change our generation. Amen. And great leaders think generationally and they think territorially, not just for today. Amen. So you can affect the entire generation uh, that you have and the one that is to come. So I give God praise for both of them. And uh, I've always found that they are people of character and integrity. And that's hard to find now in the age that we live. But I thank God for true men and women of God uh, that are humble. Amen. They're pure and they're sincere. Amen. Nowadays, you have people that have a lot of charisma, but they have no character. Amen. But Jesus was a man of character, not just charisma. Amen. He knew about the fruit of the Spirit, but he, uh, not just the gifts of the Spirit, but the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, faith, amen. Against such there is no law. So I give God praise for this great man and woman of God and all of you who are part of this great family. Amen. Praise God. It's a family. Hallelujah. My wife sends her greetings, her blessing. Amen. We're on son number two. Praise God. And uh, my father had five boys, so we had five boys and no girls. My grandfather had ten, and my other grandfather on the other side had 19 children. Amen. They had a farm. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> so I have something in common with Minnesota. Amen. I understand something about farming. And so when you're harvesting corn, et cetera, and chickens and hens all over the place, you kind of understand why they would have so many children. Amen. But of course, you know, you're still talking about the 30s and the 40s. So you could do that back then. Amen. You can have a heap load of children if you want to. But nowadays, you know, they come out saying iPad 3, iPad 4. Uh, these, this generation, they're usually born with their eyes wide open. Where it took some of us days and weeks just to open our eyes. Anybody knows what I'm talking about? In the older generation, it took a little while before you opened your eyes. But not this, this set. They, they're born just, bing, you know, they're looking everywhere. So we're, we're in a generation of visual people. Technology and visualization. Whereas in my generation, we, we were more uh, audible in terms of what we heard, not what we saw. Amen. And so now our challenge in this generation is technology. The new teacher is technology. The new educator is technology. And uh, you can preach all you want to preach. You can teach all you want to. And they won't listen to you. But put it on an iPad, they'll get it. Put it in a Kindle, they'll get it. Make it a video game, they'll get it. Because that's this generation. Amen. And I'm saying that because... We're living in a time when we have to be relevant with what is happening around us. Amen. And I give God praise for what he's doing. So my wife and children, they send their blessings here. And of course, I told I said, well, uh, you send me some sun and I'll send you some of the snow. <laughs> I said, because I came straight out of the oven, right up into the freezer. And so when I go back, I'll just thaw out. <laughs> Because it's, it's been pretty cold, and it's been wonderful. 
I haven't seen snow in a long time since we were living in New York. And then before that, I was a part of that blizzard that came through, and I think that was 94 or so, and um, it hit the whole southern states from Tennessee all the way in Kentucky, and, and I was in Tennessee at that time. So that was my first time seeing snow and actually seeing the trees snap uh, and wires go down and telephone wires go down because it was, it was very cold. Uh, but it wasn't below zero. And it wasn't 30 below either. So this is like my first time walking in a place where, you know, you look at the thing and it says 10 degrees. I was used to seeing 30 degrees, you know, 40 degrees, because that's usually your southern states. But when you get up into these here parts, you're going to have some 10, 5, minus 2, 30, (laughs) you know. So I can't even imagine zero. Thank God it's not zero outside. Amen. But this is the day the Lord has made, and we choose to rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. And the Lord has been speaking several things to me, and uh, just in case some people didn't know, today is Palm Sunday. And um, I know a lot of people don't really flow with that, but we still have to. Amen. This is a Passover season, and we're in the season of Peshach which in the Hebrew, it means it's the feast of the Passover. One of the things I love about Jesus is he celebrates the feast because he's king of the Jews. He was born a Jew, not an American, not a Bahamian, not a Jamaican, and not somebody from Europe. Amen. But he was born a Jew. And sometimes we miss things in Scripture because we're thinking with a Western mindset. And we're trying to conform Jesus to our perspective instead of understanding that he had a Jewish heritage. Hallelujah. And when you really understand that, you're able to interpret the scriptures better. You have a better understanding of why Jesus said the things he did. Why he lived the way he lived. Why he did the things he did. And the Bible talks about even at the age of 12, they found him in the temple. But he was, you know, this discourse with lawyers and doctors and rabbis. And he was just sitting there talking about the things of the law and the prophets, etc. And, you know, Mary and Joseph, that's where they found him. They wanted to kind of whoop him, but, you know, they didn't. He he just kind of told them, look, I'm about my father's business. But the reason why they were in Jerusalem is because they went to the feast. Hallelujah. And a lot of things happen during the feasts. There are seven of them. And every feast reveals Jesus. There's one more feast that has to be fulfilled, and that's the Feast of Tabernacles. It's the only feast that hasn't been fulfilled yet. Because when Jesus comes back, that is going to be the fulfillment of the feast. Where God dwells with man. And tabernacles with us. And we become the tabernacle. Hallelujah. Praise God forever. But we thank God because there has to be an understanding of the feast. It has nothing to do with Judaism. It's simple because these feasts were ordained by God. They are called God's appointed times. And God's appointed seasons. Hallelujah. Jesus celebrated the Feast of the Passover. He celebrated, amen, the other feasts that there are in the Scripture. Hallelujah. And, of course, Pentecost was also a feast, the in-gathering, amen, Feast of Weeks, that was also celebrated. After the death of Jesus, resurrection and ascension, the apostles themselves went up to the feast. Paul talks about going to the feast in Jerusalem called Pentecost. Hello, somebody. They continued to go to the feast because they understood these were God's appointed times. Now, I'm going to say something here that's going to also help you. During the feast, there are special offerings that were given. And we find that even during the feast, it goes from a new moon to a full moon. Oh, Lord. <laughs> So for two weeks, 14 days, we go from new moon 
You hear the scripture in the book of Psalms is talked about sounding the trumpet, blow the trumpet in the new moon, even at the time appointed. Speaking about the times of the feast, the shofar was blown. Are you still here? So there were special celebrations that took place. There were offerings that were given according to Leviticus chapter 23 and chapter 25 also, where it talks about uh, the males were to to appear before God three times a year. Specific times of feasts. They had to go. And they had to appear before God with a special offering. I met, because we used to live in New York, we got to, you know, be around some Jews. Is there any... You, you never met a broke one, have you? They own New York, by the way. And I don't see them. They usually don't have a problem with tithe or offering. They don't even ask the question. Because it's appointed according to their law. Are you still here? Same Bible. Same Bible. Okay. So we're talking Old Testament, New Testament. We're talking law and grace. And grace, amen, is not the enemy of the law. And the law is not the enemy of grace. Hallelujah. Jesus said, I came to fulfill the law and the prophets. And they hang on two things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. He said, all of the law and the prophets hang on these two things. I'm just trying to help you understand something. Hallelujah. Praise God. You still here? See, there are different types of laws. There are four different types. And I think I may have spoken about this before, but there's a ceremonial law. There are 613 ceremonial laws. They wash their hands. They don't approach dead bodies. They separate clean from unclean. They separate their milk or dairy product from their meat. Are you still here? These are some of the regulations and laws that are ceremonial with the Jews. They, they don't get close to the unclean or like people who had leprosy. Remember the woman with the issue of blood? They said, you're unclean. You stay over there. They had no dealings with Samaritans. That was a part of their Jewish law. You still here? Hallelujah. So that's 613 ceremonial laws. You have the judicial law that was written in the courts. So it's legislative law. That's a different type of law from ceremonial. I'm going somewhere. So you have ceremonial law, you have judicial or legislative law, then you have what I call natural law. Gravity is a natural law. The law of gravity, don't believe it, jump off the building, you find out what goes up must come down. That's a natural law. There's a natural law in your body that's uh, an invisible instruction in your blood. Eat all the sugar you want to, you'll find out there's a law. You break that law, and what happens is diabetes. Eat all the salt you want, you'll find out there's a law. Hypertension will be the consequence. you end up having high blood pressure because you have overstepped a law that's in your members already. It's a natural law for the man. Are you still here? But then there's one law called sovereign law. Say sovereign law. law. The sovereign law of God are the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20. Who wrote them? Somebody told me in school, they said, Moses. I said, no, he collected them. Who wrote them? God wrote the Ten Commandments with his own finger. Read the scripture now. And then... Moses got those Ten Commandments after 40 days, 40 nights, took them down. Of course, you know what happened there when there was Aaron and, you know, they were making this golden calf and all that. And so Moses at that time was upset. He took the tablets and he broke them. He was upset. So what did God say? God said, hello, you got to come back up here. I meant what I wrote. And you're going to spend 40 more days. So in other words... Climb the mountain again yourself. Stay up here for another 40 days because I meant what I wrote. 
Oh, I'm saying something here. So it doesn't matter if people try to take it out of school. Because God wrote it. It doesn't matter what nations say about the Ten Commandments. Because it's God who wrote it. It's not legislative. It's not judicial. It's not ceremonial. It's sovereign. God himself wrote the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not. And he meant every word. And there's nothing you or I can do about it. Because when God speaks, his word stands forever. He wrote it with his own finger. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. And while I'm on graven Im image, that actually means tattoo, by the way. Keep going. Of anything in heaven above. So you got a nice pretty bird that's been tattooed there. That's that too. Or the earth beneath. Hello. Graven. Graven. Engraved. Inscribed. Tattoo. This is up to date. Hello. People say to me, they say, well, can I, uh, 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 can I even do it? Uh, suppose it's a scripture verse. I said, well, he said of anything above. Or anything beneath. I said, I understand you're talking about witness. I said, but there are medical consequences. Because the ink is now mixing with your blood. Hello, somebody. I said, there's some consequences to it. I said, I just want to do it. I don't know which, which needle, you know, how many people have been stuck with the same needle. Anybody still here? <laughs> They've tattooed you. You just happen to be, you know, customer number 12,000. And now this brother and sister is going with the same old one. It's not like it's brand new. So something's been transferred. See, the problem is uh, people haven't had any teaching. So we just do what we want to. Anybody still here? So God wrote those Ten Commandments. Those are sovereign laws. When Jesus was talking about the law, he was not talking about sovereign law. He was talking about the 613 ceremonial laws. Come on, talk to me here. He was talking about, because think about it, he, he came close to the, un, the unclean. Hello, he didn't run away from the leper. Ceremonial laws, he stepped all over it. You're, you're not supposed to heal on the Sabbath. He said, oh, really? Come on up here, get healed. In other words, I'm operating under sovereign law, by the way. See? So it had to do with ceremonial. He was not supposed to touch a woman. So when the woman with the issue of blood came, she was on the outside of the spirit. The one that had the spirit of infirmity was outside of the temple. And he called her to him. From the outside, the outer court, to the inner court, right up to the Holy of Holies. And he laid hands on her. And then went, ah! All the Jews like, Bro. You know why? Because 613 law says you're not supposed to touch him. I'm still trying to help somebody here. Amen. Jesus did not come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill it. Hallelujah. This is trying to help somebody here. Grace came as a result of a broken law. When you break laws, then grace is available. Man. <laughs> grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So when a law is broken, grace steps in and says, I got that covered. You make a mistake, grace comes in and says, I've given them the ability to make it. You understand? See, we are law-abiding citizens. But if you break the law and you go to jail, are you still a citizen? Yes. Just not a law-abiding one. <laughs> so when we break the laws of God, are we still believers? Yes. But His grace is sufficient to be able to help you to love Him and love His country. If you love heaven... You love the kingdom, you love the king, you love his laws, 
You walk according to His commandments and His grace gives you the ability to love Him and keep His laws. And even if you break it, His grace is right there to say, okay, come on back in line here. I don't condemn you. Because under the Jewish law, they will stone you. But under God's law and sovereign law, I don't kill you. Because my grace is sufficient for you. Grace is the fulfillment of all of the law. I don't know why God has me there, but this is a season of the grace of God. The keeping power of God and enablement, enablement to help you make it in this season. Amen. And one of the things the Lord said to me, as I continue to move on here, and I want you to go to Matthew chapter 20, because I want to deal with some things as it relates to uh, this season that we are in. Now I'm going to deal with some more things this week. Amen. So make sure you get here. Hallelujah. Praise God. This is a year that God is bringing alignment for the assignment. So if you need a topic, that's a topic. Alignment for the assignment. Everyone on earth has an assignment. Let me say it again. Everyone on earth has an assignment. Everything on earth has an assignment. Birds have an assignment. Bees have an assignment, or there'll be no honey. Cows have an assignment. Holsteins have an assignment. There'll be no milk. You'll have to go to the goat. And who wants goat's milk? (laughs) Hello? (laughs) Sheep have an assignment. Lamb chops, wool. Horses have an assignment. Everything in life has an assignment. Wheels have an assignment. The car has an assignment. Everything in life has an assignment. And when the assignment is finished, they move on to another assignment. Hallelujah. Which means that your assignment has a time limit. You have to know when to move on from the assignment. If you're taking notes... Your assignment is a task or a duty that God has chosen for you to do. Your assignment is to a group of people. Your assignment is to a place. Don't forget it. And your assignment, amen, will bring provision. When you find your God-given assignment, Provision is inevitable. Money is everywhere. But money follows you and money is in the place of your assignment. When God gives vision, He gives provision for the vision. That's what I'm talking about. There are some people who are frustrated because... They're not doing God's assignment. They're doing their own. And now they're frustrated because they have no passion anymore. And now it's a task and a duty to do. Because people have fallen out of love with God and people. That's the truth. And when you are in the wrong place and you've lost your love for people and God, you will be miserable. And you will be frustrated. And you will end up taking out your frustration on people and things. You kick the cat. Anybody still here? You'll bark at the dog. You want to talk its language. You know, when you're frustrated, everything, it just doesn't work. You know, you start doing things you you don't want to do because you're frustrated. Now, I'm going to help you. Today, because your assignment is to a people. Not everyone is called for everyone. There are some people that I can reach that you can't reach. There are some people you can reach that I, I'll never be able to reach. But you are a carrier of somebody else's miracle. 
They won't get the miracle till you get there. They may not be saved until you get there. Because God has given you a special grace and a particular word that can set that person free. Whereas it may take me years to get through to them, and it takes you five minutes. And the problem is that people have been going to the wrong people. And trying to get done what only God can get done. Man, it's powerful. Your assignment is to a specific people. Don't forget it. Some people will call for children. You're not. That may not be your grace. You may not even have the patience for it. I'm in teaching. I teach high school. From 7th all the way to 12th. And before that, I was teaching from K all the way to 6th. So I, I understand education. I have a grace for them. Other people's children. <laughs> now you like to take care of Pookie. <laughs> you know, this, this is how it is. And Bebe's kids. And raising Cain. These other people's children, when they show up, they show up with their generational curses. You're not just preaching or teaching or educating the child. You have, you actually have to deal with their background. Because the DNA don't lie. Anybody still here? So you're not just dealing with them. You're dealing with their entire generation when they walk in that classroom. Because they show up with the spirits of the past. Anyways. I know for some people that's going to be like, well, whatever. Well, you ask the teachers, you'll find out. Yeah. <laughs> and some parents, when certain things happen, I remember when they told, my child, my, they, they told me in school, they said, your son did so and so and so. I said, really? They said, yeah. He took his bag and he just slammed it down, you know, and he just walked off. And I went, well, I know that bloodline. <laughs> Somebody called him short and something else and some other names, and he said, look in the mirror. <laughs> I can't believe your six-year-old said that. I said, I do, because I know my bloodline. <laughs> there are things that are inherent in our bloodline. I said, I know the Smiths, and I know uh, my other side of family, amen, that are Hannah, well, these are Bahamian names, Hannah Hasty Tynes Williams. It's on my mother's side, and they have Cuban blood on that side. So we, we're kind of loose. <laughs> <I'm sad. laughs> They're businesslike, but you rub them the wrong way, it's over. The, I, <laughs> my dad's side is a little different. They're more uh, particular in the British way of doing things. And we got Jewish on his side, too. So then I understand why I was drawn so much to the Old Testament and to the Torah and learning the Hebrew because of the Jewish line. Know the line. It helps you to know what you're dealing with. I knew that they had, we had some drinkers on one side. I know that we had, amen, high blood pressure on one side, diabetes on the next side, heart problems on another side. My dad passed away with three heart attacks in one week. Had it two times happen to him. And he had high blood pressure for 27 years. Hello. So when I found out that in that line, there's heart problems, there's blood problems, I drew the line and told the devil, you got that one, you won't get this one. Maybe they didn't know, but knowledge has increased. And now that I know, I know I'm going to eat right. Come on, talk to me here. I'm going to do it the natural way. I'm going to go the organic way. Come on, talk to me. But not only that, not just that I'm going to change the diet habits of the family. I'm going to draw the line and tell the devil, no more. You're not going to get my children or my grandchildren. You may have gotten the other side, but you're not going to get me. Because, see, and it was good for me to find out what's on one side. Then we had woman chasers on the other side. You know, the men that slap around, 
sowing their royal oats everywhere, having woman problems, can't stay with their wife. Anybody still in here? So because I knew that was the propensity, I came against perversion. And I told the devil, you're not going to have me. You're not going to have my bloodline. No, you're not. I take authority over it. I'm just trying to help somebody understand something. Do the history. Know what's in your bloodline. Tell your children. This is how grandpa was. Or great grandfather. This is what is inherent in our line. So that they know how to pray against the generational curses. Yes, I know when you were born again, certain things were broken, but you have to maintain it. And it's the maintenance of deliverance that most people can't get. So the Lord said to me, he said, I'm bringing the church into alignment for their assignment. So we have to understand that there are legalities, technicalities of your call. The life of a believer is not a mystery. When you know who you are and you know whose you are, then victory is guaranteed to you. The problem we have at most churches and most believers, they don't know who they are. And because you don't know who you are, ignorance uh, is the devil. That's one of the greatest tools that the enemy is using against the body of Christ. Ignorance. My people perish because of the lack of knowledge is ignorance. Another word for ignorance is darkness in the Hebrew and the Greek. So he keeps you in the dark. Paul says we are not ignorant of the devil's devices. So if you find out what the devices and the strategies the enemy is trying to use against you, then you can fight the good fight of faith. You don't just pray, you're praying specifically. And you're not just shooting bullets everywhere, amen, you're hitting it straight bullseye. Hallelujah. Yeah, I'm getting turned up, wind up. Hallelujah. Because in this move, we have to be dedicated, we have to be committed, and we have to speak with conviction. You have to earn the right to be heard. <laughs> I told some young people that the other day. I said, it's not just that you can talk, you know, that's good. I said, you have to earn the right to be heard. I said, earning it means that you've gone through. You have an experience. I said, I've been in ministry over 25 years. And still going. I started early. Traveled 30 nations. I started early. Train up a child in the way. They trained me up in the way. From a child. They didn't wait till I was some whippersnapper. Hello, somebody. They trained me from seedling. You know why? Children don't pay bills. They don't have any hang-ups. Talk to me, Samuel. Amen. Spirit is pure. They can look straight at you and tell you stuff. There's no weight. Anybody still here? But see, when you grow up, you form your own ideology. So you start questioning a lot of things. Whereas with a child, you say anything. You know, like, oh, yeah, I believe that. That's why Jesus said you have to become as a child. Who is the greatest in the kingdom? Why didn't he get John or Peter? He got a child. Childlike faith that simply takes the word of God, believes it, and acts on it. And they don't ask any questions. Hallelujah. Are you enjoying it? See, we got to get back to this. If we're going to come into alignment, the first thing that needs to come into alignment is your mindset. Because the season we're in, the Lord told me about this year, He said new wine structures are coming into the body of Christ. In order for you to be flexible with this season, there's a new wine skin. This church is entering into a new season with me, said the Lord God of hosts. And the Lord says there's going to be a debt-free church. He's going to give you resources to be able to build your understanding. 
and do what he's called you to do with no financial restraint. It's a supernatural season. And you have to change your mindset. Renew your mind. It's the first thing you have to do. If you can change your mind, you can change your life. It's your thought life that the devil wants. It's not your body that he wants. He can stop you with one thought. He help you how the devil speaks. He speaks through thoughts, ideas, and suggestions. Hallelujah. All he has to do is whisper in your ear and say, hey, you ain't nothing. Then you believe that, and that's what happens. Nobody cares about you. Okay? Then what's the end result? People commit suicide. Devil, the devil didn't make him do it. All he did was send a suggestion. Jump off. Jump off the building. Hang yourself. He just sends a thought. Just sends a thought. That's all he does. Remember from the beginning, that's all he did. Did God really say? Just a thought. Then all of a sudden, when he sent the thoughts and suggestions, those thoughts became images, pictures. Oh, Lord Jesus. They were seed of deception and robbed them of their destiny because they gave in to deception. All he does is send one thought. You're not going to be healed. He'll send one thought. Then you believe that. The more you start thinking on it and dwelling on it and marinating it, then as a man thinks in his heart, hello, you become what you think. You change your life by changing your mind. Be ye transformed by the renewing. Which means I have to renew my mind every day. To the will of God and the word of God. The difference between the rich man and the poor man is their mindset. One thinks I this that bring money. The other one thinks I does that bring nothing. The similarity is they both have 24 hours. But what the rich man does with his 24 is different from what the poor man does with his 24. All you need is one idea from God. One. One. I remember several years ago here in Minnesota there was a lady and uh, Mike Murdoch came into the area. Speak, he spoke at a retreat. Uh, there in Strawberry Lake, and this lady came in, and he said, God's about to give you a crazy idea. He said, you know the idea you had in your mind to do? She said, yeah. It's a crazy and a witty invention. She said, yeah. He said, the Lord said, go ahead and do it. You know what it was? Beanie Babies and Pat Rocks. She became a millionaire, billionaire overnight. Pat Rocks. Beanie Babies. Use the proceeds to do missions. Use the proceeds, come on, talk to me, to further the gospel. With one witty idea. God may give you an invention that nobody else has. One dream. It sounds crazy. It doesn't look possible. But go ahead and do it. Tell your neighbor, go ahead and do it. Maybe a business that nobody ever saw before. But what's in your house? You may only have a few vessels. Hallelujah. But Elijah sent one word to this widow woman. And she was out of debt. He asked her, what do you have in your house? There's a business in your house. Everything you've been waiting on is already in the house. Everything you need is in the house. Hallelujah. Your assignment is going to be different from somebody else's. But you are the solution to somebody's problem. Dentists solve, amen, dental problems, halitosis, root canal. Tell somebody, unless God gives you a miracle and fills your mouth with gold and silver, praise the Lord. I've seen that before. Dental miracle. The dentist 
solve the problem of bad teeth and bad breath and bad mouth. Mechanics solve the mechanical problems. Anybody still here? Don't get a mechanic to fix your mouth. Wrong assignment. The plumber can't do a carpenter's job. Anybody still here? Because everybody's assignment is different. And you are either the problem or the solution. You are sent to solve a problem. Let me help you with something here. The way that you recognize what your assignment is, is two ways. Here's the two. What you hate the most, what you love the most. Teachers hate ignorance. So we learn how to educate. Anybody still here? Doctors hate sickness and disease. So they learn how to medicate. Whatever the assignment is, you'll know by checking what you love the most and what you hate the most. Healing evangelists, amen, those who are called to a healing ministry, You always know them. They're looking for somebody to lay hands on. That's it. Anybody still here? Prophetic people. Oh, yeah. Trust me. The prophetic people will always talk about dreams and visions and what the Lord said. I don't care if you teach in church and you want to do a teaching ministry. They're going to be the board set of people. The minute you say Greek and Hebrew and let's break it down, you start going through and cutting Line upon line and precept upon precept. That's a teaching ministry right there. The one who will call to the prophetic will just kind of look at you like, when's the revelation coming? (laughs) They're always out in left gear, you know, just way out. Anybody knows what I'm talking about? The ones that are called to mission will be the ones who are sitting in church going, when are we going to Mexico? When are you going to talk about nations? So all the prophetic stuff will bore them. All the healing ministry stuff, that will bore them. Your intercessors are going to be there. When are you going to talk about prayer, brother? (laughs) Who cares about this, this, and that, and the next thing in the nation? We want to deal with prayer, intercession. I'm just trying to help somebody here. See, there's, you know what you've been called to do because it hits your spirit. And certain books, you'll be drawn to read. So your prayer warrior, there'll be R.A. Torrey, A.W. Tozer, Andrew Murray. Come on now. The art and the intercession and prayer in Oswald Chambers. Hallelujah. Cindy Jacobs. Hallelujah. Joy Dawson. I know all of them. Dutch Sheets, because I do prayer. I understand intercession. Jim Gall, and the list goes on and on with prayer. But if you are called, amen, to another area then this is why I'm saying to you, you know by what you love and what you hate the most. Is that helping anyone here? So the Lord said to me, he said, I'm bringing the churches into alignment. It's an understanding. Change your mindset. Begin to think, amen, the thoughts of God according to the word of God. Begin to understand. Your second has to do with understanding times and seasons. You change your mindset, you change your life. But it comes to a place of understanding now, times and seasons. Let me help you. There are a lot of people who operate... They're in the right time, but the wrong season. One is Kairos and one has to do with Kronos. Okay? You can be in the right season and move at the wrong time. Maybe the season of marriage, but that doesn't mean get married tomorrow. Anybody still here? Maybe a season of moving and relocation, but that doesn't mean, okay, I'm packing up and we're out of here. Wrong time. Maybe the season. The prophetic ministry is always a ministry, or when I talk about the prophetic and revelation, amen, it's always seasonal. Which means God could speak now, but that word is not for now. 
That word is for two years. Hello, Noah. 120 years. How do you like to wait? Didn't even know what an ark was. Didn't know what rain was. Didn't even know what a flood was. But he had to wait three generations. And then it came to pass. Which means my great-grandfather heard about this crazy guy named Noah who was talking about the ark and the flood coming. Yeah, right. Great-granddaddy is dead. Grandfather is now talking about it. And Noah is still walking around building. Think about it. Chibo seal. I got that. The word of God will sustain you all the way to the fulfillment of it. Your purpose preserves your life. The assignment preserves your life. The prophecy over your life preserves your life. As long as you are in alignment with God, that prophecy will be fulfilled in you. And the people around you who are the naysayers will watch it come to pass. God will keep you alive long enough to say, I told you so. <laughs> yeah. Could you imagine the grandfather walking around and still talking about Noah? Granddaddy died. Great-grandfather died. Now the, the other generation is there, and they're saying, this is what great-grandpa said, and Noah, you still around, and they're dead. This is the word they told us. Now we're watching it come to pass. Only eight people were saved on that ark. And while I'm on that, praise the Lord, the Bible said every animal, every male found his female. Not E-male, not G-male, not she-male. Adam didn't find Steve and Eve didn't find Yvette. Even the animals had more sense of male and female. The animal kingdom has outdid the earth in that area. And if you read the scripture, it says every male found his female. What was connected, that's how God made them, male and female. Not male and male, female and female. Hello, somebody. And people say what they want to, too bad. Tell them, look at the animal kingdom. They're sending a message every day. <laughs> Hallelujah. And if you find two male dogs together, you got a question. It's very rare. But it's not going to be the whole dog race. Hello. There's always going to be somebody loony and off. But there are people who are trying to argue, well, what is kingdom? You can't argue with the book. You can't argue with God. You can argue with religion, but you can't argue with God. Because this book is not religious. Hallelujah. This is not a religious book. This is a kingdom book. The king wrote the book. And his book is called a constitution. You don't vote in a kingdom. Who voted Queen Elizabeth in? Nobody. Who voted Juan Carlos in of Spain? Nobody. Why? Because they're monarchs. You don't vote them in. They were born in it. Can I bring it up to date? God has made us kings and queens and priests forever. We're royal generation. Royal priests of the believers. You still here? Are you still here? You're a king. You're queens and kings and priests. Nobody voted you in the kingdom. No one can vote you out. They might can throw you out of church, but not the kingdom. They give you the right hand of fellowship and the left foot of justice. I'm just trying to help you. Nobody voted you in. Nobody can vote you out. Part of the alignment is understanding your mindset, understanding time. These are perilous times. Wars, rumors of wars. Earthquakes everywhere. Pestilence. Jesus prophesied it. Hello. Don't mind people. Oh, it's all doom and gloom. I said, you know what? Just read the book. I didn't prophesy it. Jesus did. Take it up with him if you're angry. If you're angry. It's him who said famines are coming. 
It's him who said that wars were going to break out. It's God who said it. Jesus spoke it. Matthew chapter 25. You still here? And sometimes God has to allow an earthquake to take place to wake up a nation. Because what got you saved is going to take twice and three times more for this generation. Oh, I know what I'm saying. When Pastor Steve and Pastor Trish got saved and born again, it didn't take as much. I was saved in 1979. It didn't take much for me. And they said, heaven and hell, God and the devil, it went okay. As a child. Anybody still here? I didn't question nothing. I wasn't rebellious. Didn't take much. Conviction just came. Whoa, and I was there. This generation, you got to press them, torch them, cook them, fry them, grill them. <laughs> I'm just telling you. It's just the truth. We didn't have any distractions. We didn't, have, we didn't know what a computer was. We used our brain. I remember when they came out with a calculator. Because everything, you had to show all working. You had to add your own self. And abacus. <laughs> you had to count marbles. Anybody still here? From that age, you'd understand what I'm talking about. Nowadays, the computer does it for you. One key, everything's done. Our days, go to the library. Look up your own information. Do your own research. You got about 20 set of books, then another 40. And you got to go through. Now, Google it. Whoop, and you're done. Seconds. And you can have information from everywhere. So now we're in a generation, everything is at the tips. Whereas our work ethics has dropped. Because what we had to work for and search for, now it's been discovered. And so you don't have to work anymore. You don't even have to cook anymore. Put it in the microwave, press 3, 3, 3, 3, bup, 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 it's done. <laughs> Ice cream, you can buy it. Back in the day, we had a wooden bucket and a hole in it. You had to get the ice and you had to turn that thing. Anybody knows that? And you had to get all the salt and pour it around. It's the old way of doing it. I remembered it. Yeah. It was the best ice cream ever. All the snow out here, we made snow cones. On the first, I think, first or second drop, they always say, first fall or second fall was the purest of the snow. Because the first one had to do with getting all the impurities away. And then your second was a pure one. So you just grab that up, you put your some cream in there, put your sugar, and you're ready to go. It's the old way of doing things. We used to catch the water from the rain, and that was our bottled water. So we are having water all the time. We didn't know nothing but Zephyr Hills and Fiji. We knew heaven's water. <laughs> Call rain. It's more purified than what we were drinking. Anybody still here understand what I'm saying? You had to work for things. The times and seasons have shifted. There's less people doing work now because everything is an EBT card now. So the government is doing your work. You do nothing and they pay you for it. Hello. So we've become dependent upon the system. But can I tell you, the Babylonian system is going to be exposed and it's going to crash. We have to know the times we're in. Things are changing in the church. There's a lot of shifting and changing and shakings that God is doing in the earth realm. The Catholic Church just went through, which is another part of fulfillment of prophecy. We're closer to the end than we really think and are. Anybody still here? Times and seasons are shifting and changing. Laws are changing. But the Lord said to me, He said, What I'm about to do, eyes have not seen and ears have not heard. Neither has it entered into the hearts of man the things that I have prepared for them. And I said, the Lord, I spoke to the Lord about it and began to pray. And He said, I want you to tell my people what's about to take place. And I said, Yes, Lord, I hear what you're saying. He said, I want them to understand the times and the seasons that they are in. 
He said, because if you can evaluate the time and the season, you'd know how to move in power. You will not be, amen, discouraged because you'll know that there's greater glory that's ahead. If you are able to discern the times and the season, you will be the right place at the right time. You'll be able to calculate when your miracle is going to happen. God, I'm trying to help somebody here. Remember I began to talk about the feast? Well, during every feast, there's 14 days, when I said from the new moon to the full moon. And usually it was at that time, in other words, the heavens were open. Now, because the Jews understood that, they knew when to sow the seed. Because they knew they were under an open heaven. But can I also tell you something about that? At the times appointed by God, the angels of God always showed up. I'm going to prove it. John chapter 5, there was a time of the season of the Passover. The feast of the Jews was nigh. And what happened? A certain angel went down and stirred the water. Whoever stepped in first was made whole of whatever disease they had. What time was it? What season was it? At the same season of that Passover. Oh, Lord Jesus, don't miss what I just told you. In other words, we are in a season coming in the Passover now. So the angelic of God, the heavens are already open. The waters are being stirred. And whoever steps in in this season can be made whole of whatsoever disease they have. If you're able to discern the time, you can calculate when the miracle is about to take place. I'm just trying to help somebody here. Hallelujah. It says it was a certain time, certain season, certain angel. Never called who the angel's name was. Don't really care. May have been Raphael. Rapha being... Healer. Hello, somebody. I'm just trying to help you. They always showed up during times and seasons. Not just the angelic, but the heavens were open. Lord Jesus is going to help you with something else here. The Feast of Pentecost, what happened? And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were gathered together in one place, in one accord. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and filled the house where they were sitting. Hallelujah. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. They began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Are you still here? In the same time of the Feast of the Pentecost, chapter 1 of Acts, there were angels there. One eleven, And those angels said, Why stand you here, King? This same Jesus that you have seen will come in like manner. The angels were present because they guard the time of God. They are moving within the seasons of God. I'm trying to help you with something. If you understand times and seasons, then you know when heaven is open. Lord Jesus. Which means every prayer that you pray will not be hindered. Lord, I'm trying to help somebody here. It means that miracle signs and wonders can take place quicker because they are on schedule in that season. Are you still here? Certain seasons, certain times. Hallelujah. See, when you know it, then you know when to sow your seed to reap a harvest because you know the heavens are open. You understand what's about to take place in times and seasons. It was the Palm Sunday, which is today, that Jesus went through Jerusalem in order to fulfill a prophecy. Hallelujah. And the prophecy, as we begin to close here, the prophecy said that it may be fulfilled, which is spoken by the prophet. Hallelujah. Saying, tell ye the daughter of Zion, behold, your king cometh unto thee. Meek and sitting upon an ass and a colt, the foal of an ass. And then he said here, and his disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. Hallelujah. They put their clothes there. The great multitude came. Uh, They cut down branches from the tree. And they... Put them in the way and the multitudes went and they began to speak and say these words. Hosanna to the son of David. 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now verse 10 of chapter 21 says, And when he was come unto Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? I'm going to help you with something. God spoke to me and he said, He said, Tell Destiny Church and this area, He said, I'm about to move your city because the King of Glory is coming in. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, you everlasting doors and gatekeepers, and the King of Glory shall come in. Who is this King of Glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of Glory shall come in. We speak to the gates of Ashby to be open. We speak to the gates of Alexandria to be open. We speak to the gates of Minnesota to be open. We speak to the gates of North Dakota, South Dakota. Be lifted up, you everlasting doors. The King of glory is about to come through your house, come through the church, come through this area. The King of glory, His glory shall be revealed. The King is coming.